I don't know whether you're anything like me, but uh, when I come to the book of Exodus in, uh, in my devotional time or, or sometimes in study, uh, I get to this point about, around about the 2021 mark and I kind of switch off a little bit and I, th- I think, oh, that's just, that's a lot of stuff to start indulging in. And uh, you'll notice from here on, it's, it's quite, um, well, how can we put it? It's, it's quite legalistic in its terminology and so on. So you, you've got to bear in mind that uh, hidden behind some of these things and revealed by the Spirit is, is instruction that is, is required in each and every one of us. And uh, we sometimes need to dig a little bit deeper uh, in, in our own wills and also in seeking the Lord to reveal to us the message that is found in these things. So you find a lot of people, including preachers, ministers, pastors, they switch off at this stage and they kind of say, now we, we've come to the end of our studies in Exodus and we'll move on a little bit because they think some, you know, it's a little bit dreary, it's a little bit long in the tooth. But there's detailed aspects of worship in here. And uh, there's rules and, and understandings of social order that, uh, although they're applied to the Israelites and a generation that have come out of slavery, they, we can learn some things in the 21st century. In fact, I think that's one of the reasons why the church has become so diverse in its worship. And, and in some respects, wandered away from uh, the practical aspects that God wanted us to apply to our lives in worship and Him. You'll, you'll see that in, in life, worship, um, the, the praise and the, the, the understanding of what is meant by worship is somewhat deluded. I say that with all respect to some, but I, I just find that sometimes, that, it's, that, that, that people don't, they don't respect worship as they once did. It, it's more about them than it is about God. And that's a very, very um, troubled way to relate to worship. We've got to remember God told us to worship Him. He made us to worship Him and to have a right relationship with Him. And the minute we start turning that around to us and and it being about what we want to see, what we want to experience, things can start to go very wrong. And indeed, I believe the Lord starts to withdraw from the practicalities of life in many different ways. So, we're going to have a look at the the ordered understanding of life over the next few uh, weeks and possibly months and see what that instruction gives for us today. We're looking at this particular passage tonight, um, 18 to 21 records the people's response to Yahweh and all, in all that He gave to them, or wanted to give is the word that I'll use, all the more He wanted to give to them. But they refrain. Notice they pulled back. And that is one of the aspects that I believe many people do. Unknown to themselves, they, they refrain. They pull back a little bit because some of the areas that God wants to touch and wants us to bring in worship, they, they think are too, as it were, personal, too close to the heart. I'm not going to let you have that bit, Lord, they'll say. We're not going to come too close otherwise we'll die. Notice that's what the Israelites said. And that's one of the key verses that we need to apply to this Scripture. The Israelites recognized the power of God. 
the, the righteousness of God and the holiness of God, and they, with, they reframed. They pulled back. They said, oh, Moses, you go and do our dirty work. We're going to just sit here. We're going to just hang on here because if God speaks to us, we know we're a sinful people and, and we will die. Now, it might not have been in the physical, although we do see the physical aspect of life where some of them die for their total lack of fear and respect. But we do see that spiritually they die. Spiritually, they're just drawn up in themselves. Notice I said themselves. Isn't that what I just said, mentioned? It's themselves they want to bring in worship these days. Why would we ever want to bring ourselves in worship to God? We have nothing, absolutely zero to offer. He is the one we should worship because He is everything. So, we're going to look at what the people of Israel, Israel saw on Mount Sinai, what they saw happening to Moses, and um, what he was able to what what he was able to gain or glean from God in His presence. And let's not forget that that is what worship is about. It's it's about stepping into His presence and allowing allowing His his, his awe, his, his magnificence to just ooze on us. But that's, that's not our choice. We can't just switch that off and on like a light switch. He chooses when He draws near to us. If, if, we, if we meditate on Him and go into His presence, it's because He has allowed it. It's because we are doing what He asks of us. We saw this morning that the Ten Commandments must be seen as um, distinct, distinct from the person of Yahweh. He, he has set these in place so that we can, we can understand how we are sinning, and we can look to Him for guidance out of that situation. When we look at what Yahweh has done, what God has done for us, He, he includes these instructions and these expectations in His presence. And there's another key aspect. It's, it's in His presence that we we need to draw near to. We need to come to the bottom of the mountain and lift our eyes and our gaze to Him alone. So, the first aspect I want to look at is in verse 18. And uh, what, I've spoke, what I've mentioned tonight is the peace and the rest that we receive when we're in His presence. That's, that's how I want us to remember this and, and bring it. But to give it its full title, if you were writing an essay or something, uh, you know, keep him at a distance or find peace and rest is how I would sum it up. Keep him at a distance or find peace and rest. You see, at a distance from God, we, we keep him at arm's length, don't we? at a distance from God. If we do what the Israelites were doing here, we keep them away from us. So, the people responded by keeping their distance. That's what they, they instructed of Moses. They saw the fire on the mountain. They saw, um, they saw the smoke, and they saw 
and knew that that was the presence of God. It must have been spectacular in a sight. It must have been absolutely awestruck amazing. It must, you must, they mustn't have been able to take their eyes off what was happening. And when we remember that, we see that it's really, it, it's God was coming down. He was coming down in His presence onto a sinful world, into a sinful area. Yes, it was on His mountain, but it was still a sinful place. It was black and it was dark. And the, and the sheer magnitude of His light and His wonder and His awe must have burnt and scorched the rocks so that they were, became white and clean, and the smoke that would have belched off them would have been so dramatic What did they do? They trembled with fear. Now, this wasn't a good fear. You must look at the Hebrew here and say that this wasn't a good fear. This was a fear that, that would have gone through to the bone. You know those times when you realize that something's going to happen and, well, this could be it. One of those fears. Not a fear of reverence, but it was a fear of shock and awe. It was, it was, it was going to come upon them. They knew it. Just very often, like we know it, when we come to salvation. Remember that place where we were, we were on our knees and we were before Him when we said, you know, I've, I've just got nothing. It's you. It's all you. That moment where we turned our lives over from us running it to Him running it. I believe that some of us, very often, we need to go back to that place. We need to find that place and we need to lay down before Him and say, I'm, I'm just making a complete mess. Will you help me redirect my life towards Jesus? Of course, God honors that, doesn't He? Israel, if they'd accepted Yahweh's invitation to intimacy, and this is what He was asking of them. They saw the burning, they saw the smoke, and they knew that death was close. So their, their response was, Moses, you go and do it. We are keeping them at a distance. I wonder how many times we have done similar, where we've, we've come to an issue or we've come to a point in our lives where we know that there's a burning issue. We've just stopped there and said, no, I'm, I'm going to keep you at a distance, God. I'm not going to let you into that area. I don't want to let you into that area. Because that, that, that moment I do, you're in control. And I want to be in control. I want to have my faculties about me. I don't want to be run by the Spirit. The people kept God at a distance. Moses wanted to do the same, didn't he? Remember, if we go back to when Moses met God at the burning bush, came up with all his, his, his attitude and his, his statue, came walking up with his sandals on, and the Lord said, take them off, you're in a holy place. And, and Moses reacted to that a little bit, although he did recognize that God was God. At that point, Moses was burned up by the bush. Moses' old self. And he was resurrected into this new, this new person who walked with God and took instruction from God and was guided by God. And that's how we see the Exodus. Is that what our fear is then? 
when we come to a place where God wants to deal with us and He wants to do something in our life? Is that what our fear is when we say, I don't want you to burn this up? I don't want to be resurrected into something different. I'm quite happy with who I am. Perhaps we don't want to die to the old. As verse 19 puts it, and that's the next point, I don't want to get too close. Because when I get too close, it's all or nothing. Israel had praised God for what God had done for them, but now they, they were putting their hands up and saying, don't come any closer. It's one of those places where we are too much like Israel, where the church is quite happy with their experience, with what they get from worship. with what He does in our lives. He's granted us the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's granted us that by His grace and His mercy, He sent Him down. Notice the song we sang earlier, He sent Him down to come amongst us what He was wanting to do here with the Israelites. He was wanting to come down on the mountain and, and be in their presence and in an intimate place where there was no sin, where they recognized His power and His might, and they, they feared Him in worship. But it took all those years later that the Lord sent Jesus to be the Lamb on the cross where He died for us. We didn't need to die. But now He offers us that we can be transformed through His power, through His peace. We can be, we can be resurrected really without any pain because Jesus did it all. See, Israel was under the this illusion that uh, they could keep at a distance and have all the benefits, all the blessings. Israel didn't want any more. They just wanted a life of luxury. They certainly didn't want to be sanctified. They certainly didn't want an intimate relationship. They just wanted all the benefits. Just think of your own relationships, and I'm sure you can testify that on both sides of the matter, you know that one is seeking a more intimate relationship than the other. There's points in our lives where it happens in, in, our, in our marriages, with our sons and our daughters, with our families, where one side is pushing to come a bit closer, but we are reluctant and we, we keep them back. Well, it's the same here, and it's the same with God. Israel kept them back. Now, at this point, after these two understandings, two verses, 18 and 19, we see in verse 20 and 21, we see Moses explaining certain things, or he brings an explanation of, of what the Israelite nation should be like. Notice that he brings us to an understanding of saying, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you and keep you from sinning. But the people remained at a distance. Notice that word, do not be afraid. Throughout the Bible, as many times that it comes, do not be afraid. In Isaiah 41, verse 10, it says, Moses said, do not be afraid. The prophet Isaiah is, is bringing to them that they should not fear God, but they should work with Him, and they should be intimate with Him. 
Again and again, you see through the, the books of the Bible that this fear means an intimacy, means a close relationship with God. Do not be afraid in a fearful way. Exodus 14, if we were to go back and jump to that, we see again that, that Moses said to them, do not be afraid. This is God, and He wants to be your God, and He wants you to be your, His people. Why would you, want, why would you fear Him in a, in a terrible way? But one of the most key aspects of this is Matthew 10. And if we turn to Matthew 10, we can see in verse 26 to 33 this wonderful understanding of Jesus. Who better to tell us about the different things? Matthew 10 and verse 26 tells us these things. So do not be afraid of them, for they are nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden, that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in the ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs on your heads are numbered. They're all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. See, very often fear comes from the deceiver, from Satan himself. And, and that's what Jesus was alluding to. That's what He was bringing to an understanding of us. The fear that very often we have when we come close to God is a fear that man has instilled in us through sin. What Jesus was getting across to the people and getting across to you and I is that we shouldn't fear God because He is our Father, but we should fear the One who will torment us in in hell, the ones that can only touch us with sticks and stones as we remember as children, not to be feared, just to be pushed aside and allow our God to draw closer to us. That was what Moses was alluding to. Don't be afraid of God. But Yahweh is a loving God. Yahweh is a, a God who has done all of these things. He's taken you out of slavery. But they still rejected Him. So Yahweh responds. First we see Moses responds, then Yahweh responds. God responds. He continues to pursue the relationship. He spoke to Moses and he told him. He told him in the thick darkness where, where everybody else couldn't see. He saw him and he spoke to Moses with a concern that he wanted his people to be whole. Through Moses, the people would continue to seek him. Continue to speak to the people and continue to make an effort towards intimacy. This is the promise of God. It's a promise that He will pursue you no matter what you've done, no matter what you are, and no matter how you are feeling. He's still there. He's still the rock of ages. He's still the one who we can stand upon. Still the one who wants to 
have a relationship with us. The, the one who wants to transform us. And how does He do this? Well, He reminds, he reminds um, Moses that there, there is to be no other gods in place, nothing between Him and them. He reminds Moses that they aren't to make silver or gold idols. Why does he, why does he re- reiterate that again? Why does he bring that again to them? Well, it's all about what we want, isn't it? It's all about the kinds of things that we are interested in, especially silver and gold. It's not just the raven or the, the, that likes silver or gold. We do. We love it. When we were away in Italy, actually, we were staying above a jeweler's. Uh, it was a, the, the guy owned a jewelry shop, and the amount of people we saw flocking to that shop was incredible. They lived a life that was quite often dirty and wretched, but yet they loved silver and gold. And I think that's similar for us. We like the shiny things in life. We like the good things in life. We like nicer lives. So God God warns the people. And of course, as we know the story, that warning falls on deaf ears. And we look at that in the future. But He brings to them two aspects of worship that are very interesting and very alluding to our way of life. He says to them, bring whole burnt offerings and offering a goat, the goat is to be killed and the whole body is to be burnt up. The whole offering goes up in smoke. To God. It rises up to heaven so that he, he, he has that understanding of what the people are willing to sacrifice. To us, it seems nonsensical, doesn't it, that, that, that they would burn a whole animal. It's more used to us than it is to God. But to him, it was an offering, an offering of worship. And through the smoke and the burning and the consumption of it, it goes as a pleasing aroma to God. In the same way, he asks for a fellowship offering. He asks for that closeness again. He says, bring those, bring those aspects that are close to you and lay them before me. And then I will know where your heart is. When you think about it, a fellowship offering and a burnt offering, they're, they're part of, of what we would class as, as, a, as a barbecue today. The consumption of enjoyment and offering is in, is in fellowship together. We can celebrate the offering which promises fellowship both with God and among people. One of the diverse things that God saw in the people was they were quick to turn against each other. And that's why He brought six commands that spoke to our relationships between man. First, He set out the four that I mentioned this morning that were key to His relationship. Then He sets out six that were key to our relationship. We draw to an end of this, but He's not finished there, is He? He speaks of stones and building an altar. He speaks of of being clothed and not clothed in the right way. Why does He do that? Why does He bring these things? They seem a little bit strange. Don't walk up the steps. Don't dress stones. Just make it of earth. Just make it of a plain, simple rock. 
When we think about it this way, though, we see why God wanted it that way. When you think about it, if we took a stone and we tried to dress it up as people do these days with a fine garden walls and the, the lovely alluding um, descriptions as you go into a, a, a village, it's God that's made, it's man that's made that. Man has formed that and shaped it. He's dressed that stone up with his chisel and he's made it. And when people drive past, they say, oh, didn't Billy make a good job of that wall? Didn't he do a lovely job on those dressed stones? Isn't that house magnificent because it's been set off with what man can do? So he said to the people, just pick a rock up and make an altar. Just use the earth that I've given you. Just get all that I've created because it'll be me you worship. One of the reasons the Puritans had very staunch, straight churches with, with no idols inside it, one of the reasons we have similar, we just have a plain church, plain walls, nothing that it's alluding to man. It's for a reason. You know, it's for a reason, because one of the easiest things to do when we're in worship is to look at an idol, is to look at an image and to see its, its wonder and its magnificence and to say, boy, didn't that fella do a good job? When we're in worship, all we should be thinking about is God. When we're in worship, all we should be wanting to do is proclaim His name his glory, and honor Him. I think one of the strangest things that I see in here is, is, is the interpretation of why He tells them not to go up on the step. To us, it's a little bit strange, but to Him it was right, because when you think about it these days, worshipers are of dressed in the strangest of items, may I say, I'm going to be careful what I say here, or less items. We seem to have gone full tilt, haven't we, in our, in our worship aspects. You know, once upon a time, you would come dressed respectfully, dressed long dresses, um, dressed men and with a suit and ties and a jacket or or, you know, dressed respectfully. These days when we see uh, worship taking place, the, 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 the person who's leading worship is dressed quite sparsely. It's, it's gone all about in a, in a very unusual way. Well, here, here's something we can apply to our 21st century worship. What about it being about God rather than the person worshiping? In the, in the simplistic items. I'm not talking about what kind of material you use. I'm talking about the way in which they're sparsely dressed and they're showing off their own, their own things. God said to Moses, tell the people when, when they worship me, do it respectfully. Do it in a way that is, is, um, is right and proper. Don't let the people see things that they shouldn't see. Don't let them, their minds be able to wander. You know, the things that God set in place for the Israelites in those days could teach us a thing or two these days. And, and I'm not a stick in the mud. I'm not our own fuddy-duddy. I understand where people come from when they say it's changed. Things have gone on a little bit. But for me, I think the attraction, and there's the key word, the attraction 
tends nowadays to go towards man and woman and all that they have to offer. Our God has done so much for us. This morning we looked at an aspect of creation. This evening we, we look at the way in which He wants to have a relationship with, with us. The way he, he continues, no matter how they've pushed Him back and said, no, 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 Moses, you go and do it. We could learn so much from what they have gone through in the Exodus. We could learn so much by applying these Scriptures to our own lives. You know, Jesus said, He said one key aspect. The Father wants a people who worship in spirit and in truth. Least the distance grows. If we learn anything from this, it's that we, when we come into worship with God, we come into His presence. And we come in a way that is for Him, for Him alone, not for us, not for anything we can bring. It's all about Jesus. It's a song that I remember very often. It's all about Jesus. He is the one who should be central in our worship. He is the one who should be, who our eyes should be fixed on. Worship is about God and God alone. Any other worship is idle. And we know what happens to idols. Let's uh, come to worship Him by singing our last item of praise. And uh, the last song we're going to sing is, uh, Be Still My Soul. Because unlike the Israelites, the Israelites didn't want to get any closer. But when we get closer, when we draw near to Him, when He allows us to come to Him, we are still. We're still in awe of Him. And, and that's how we can come this night. Be still, my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief and pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change he faithfully will remain. Be still, my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend. Through thorny ways lead to a joyful end. Sing.
of the Lord Jesus Christ and love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all and all whom we love and pray for both this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>